Hello, welcome to a surprise edition of Rahalastapa with the amazing John Oliver. Kept this one a secret until broadcast day. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I've been trying to get John on for many, many years, but the wonderful COVID disease has meant it's happened remotely, transatlantically, and it was lots and lots of fun. Um, I'm pretty much better. I'm back in bed, you can see, but... Um, I had chemotherapy last week. I'm just a bit tired. It's okay. Um, so uh, these I've managed to keep going. I've got plenty in the can still. We're going to keep going and hopefully everything's looking all right. I'm feeling lots better. Um, and uh, the future should be bright. Let's hope so. Uh, do keep supporting us. Go com slash badges. Do keep watching us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash rkherring. And use your Amazon Prime subscription to subscribe for free and give us free money if you can be asked. GoFasterStrike.com for all your downloads and books needs if you want to contribute. And thank me for still working so hard, even though I've had cancer. So please support me. Um, nearly all your money goes back into making more podcasts, so you can't, you can't lose unless, you know, I die. In which case, um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably give the money to my kids. Anyway, let's sit back, relax. This is a really great one, and thank you very much to John Oliver for doing this on his day off. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Have a step up. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a man who is, is just walking in now. It's Richard Herring. Hello! Welcome to another episode of Richard Herring's Leopard Sporting Tank Tops podcast. That's right. Uh, it's very difficult to come up with a new idea for podcasts. podcast. Uh, each week, me and a guest will capture a leopard and attempt to dress it in a tank top of our choice. And uh, the best dressed leopard will win. That's the That's the new format for the show, uh, though I was hanging around uh, with all the AstraZeneca vaccinees, who I am one of now. Uh, it's fantastic. We hate those Pfizer guys. We hate them. And they're spreading all this news that we get blood clots. We don't get blood clots from AstraZeneca. It's the best. After this is all over, there will be a war between AZ and Pfizer, and may the best team win it is us. They all call it Rahalastapa. Anyway, um, so uh, uh, more uh, bollock-based news. Um, <laughs> a lot of you uh, got annoyed about me talking about discovering I had aphantasia last year, where I, and I did go on about it a lot, that I can't imagine three-dimensional objects in my, or anything in my mind. I can't see anything in my mind. I bet you're wishing I was talking about that again now, don't you? Now I've had a ball off, and that's all I talk about. Um, I, it's about two and a half weeks, nearly three weeks since I had the operation. Uh, just last week, probably on Friday... I just decided to. Uh, it was time to test it out and see if it still worked. Up until then, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a dodgy thing because you're thinking, you know, what what's going to come out? Will anything come out? Will is the one that's gone going to still try and suck something out of my body to uh, uh, you know throw away? Uh, and uh, will there be less? Will there be less volume? Which is very important, I know, to you youngsters out there. Uh, it seemed to work fine. I'm not sure of uh, the, whether the volume is less, whether it's half. It didn't seem to be half, but I did. I forgot to do tests beforehand. I should have done some science experiments and collected. And it's nice in that picture, if you're watching the video, that uh, whoever's got that sperm sample has labelled it with sperm. And that is a good thing. <laughs> Don't put who sperm is. <laughs> Just put a thing saying sperm on there and that will be fine. But anyway, it works. I'm still a man. And maybe half a man, but I'm still a man. Uh, and I wish I'd approached it scientifically. Uh, and uh, in in non bollock based news, I've been watching uh, Mary Poppins with my children. It's delightful that they they loved it. My daughter wanted to watch it twice. She loved it so much, and it's a film set 111 years ago and made uh, before I was born. So it's kind of crazy. But I'd never noticed in the um, Obviously, the authentic is the main take. It's an authentic glimpse into the life of Cockneys. That's the usual take, isn't it? But there's there's a lot more to it than the strangled vowel sounds of Dick Van Dyke. My main issue with the film is that the kids who are meant to be too much for the nanny bear are two of the most adorable children you could ever hope to meet. It'd be nice to see Poppins dealing with some fucking terrors 
Uh, though apparently in the book she's a bit nastier. Uh, anyway, my favourite bit, which I'd never noticed before, is when Bert is singing It's a Jolly Holiday with Mary. Uh, and then Mary takes a verse. It's meant to be Poppins complimenting the chimney sweep for being a gentleman, but it goes on for so long that it begins to undermine itself and seem like a criticism. I'm most certain it's deliberate because it's very funny. Poppy, Poppins sings, it's a jolly holiday with you, Bert. Gentlemen like you are few, though you're just a diamond in the rough, Bert. Underneath your blood is blue. It's, it's nice. It's so far so complimentary. You'd never think of pressing your advantage. Forbearance is the hallmark of your creed. OK, it's nice, I suppose. No need to press the point, Mary. Bert's a nice guy for sure. Yeah. And he's definitely no sex pest, but he's still a human being with needs and desires. He isn't going to try anything on, but that doesn't mean he's not a virile and sexual human being. Poppins, though, insists on clarifying further. A lady needn't fear when you are near. Your sweet gentility is crystal clear. Dick Van Dyke even pulls a face at this bit as if to say, all right, that's enough. I'm a nice guy, but it'd be nice if you thought of me as someone who might possibly be a potential sexual partner for someone. But anyway, then as if to prove Mary Poppins' point, point Bert does a funny dance with some penguins with his trousers bunched around his ankles. Yep, no one's going to go go with uh, do that guy for anything more than laughs. No wonder he has to spend his days poking brushes up chimneys. That's as close as he's ever going to get. That is my Mary. Yeah, it's only taken 60 years, but taken Mary Poppins down there, my fine friends. All right. Uh, my guest this week uh, is probably, I mean, it's hard to pick. There's so many roles to pick with this guy. Uh, he's probably best known as Dick Pants in The Love Guru. That's probably the why we're here today. Uh, but all, uh, my favourite role, of course, is uh, Felix Pardiggle in the 1985 BBC adaptation of Bleak House. Um, will you please welcome the amazing John Oliver. That's not John Oliver, that's Chris Evans. <laughs> there we go. It's John Oliver. I, what a terrible disappointment that would be if I had to interview Chris Evans, not that one. I mean, it's not... It, the likeness is there. <laughs> We're not. Dis it's not so shocking that for a second I didn't think. Oh yeah, that is me. I'm wearing a different shirt than I thought. It could have been like the BBC thing where they got the taxi driver in by mistake. Yes, and exactly. We got John Oliver. Oh no, it's just a bloke in Wales. <laughs> um, how are you, John? Thank you so much for doing this. Fine, thanks. I'm doing all right. We We've been trying to get you on for years and years, but of course you live in America. It's made it hard before. That is the problem. There's been some ocean-based <laughs> hurdles in the way. Yeah. But, but now, now thanks, thanks to COVID, COVID we are right. straddling the world. One of the many great <laughs> things about this crushing <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> so well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, both those roles that I mentioned in the introduction there, but especially uh, Felix Pardigal, 1985, you must have been... A tiny child. I was six when I was six when we filmed it. <laughs> Same right. when we filmed it. When they filmed it, and I was on set. I really don't want to take any ownership over. Well, the BBC and I talked a little about what we wanted the role to be. Uh, yeah, they were filming nearby at the school I went to in Bedford, and they were looking for a kid with black hair and brown eyes. Right. I was two for two there. Therefore, <laughs> next thing, next thing I know, I'm six years old. Being pulled out of school, being dressed up in um, in Victorian clothing, and yeah. I basically end up now living almost an offensive stereotype of an English person in America. Because there's a kind of, there might be a lazy implication of, oh, if you're English, you were probably in a Dickensian drama as a kid, weren't you? Yeah, I was. Did you play an orphan? Shit, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, but you're unlucky because Daniel Radcliffe was in David Copperfield, wasn't he? Which is the BBC adaptation, and he was just born at the right time to then c pass over to Harry Potter. I mean, and his mum and dad were casting directors, I think, which might have helped. But you, that could have been you. Could, I mean, you'd have been a good Harry Potter if he'd been sort of just five or six years down the line, really. If he'd just yeah, been a bit I later. To, I used to get um, "You Look Like Harry Potter" screamed a lot at me <laughs> in England when I did stand up. It would, there would basically be. I'd have the, the amount of time be between walking on stage and getting to the microphone. It was just, a, <laughs> it would be like, David Baddiel's here. You know he's not. We're in a, there's six of us here in a basement of a pub. David Baddiel is very much not here. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, and then uh, Harry Potter when the books came out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, he could have been, but that would have been, that would have been an interesting life wouldn't it would have been a different life um dick pants in the love guru i want to tell you that i've never seen the love guru so i can't judge it i was going to watch it today and i went to amazon prime it cost three pound 49 to rent it and i thought I, i'm not i don't think it's worth three pound 49 dusted you off <laughs> yeah 
three yeah. pound four. Oh, so you don't know? So, so we could be sitting on a masterpiece. You are not in a position to make an informed take on it. Uh, I'm not. I can't really. So you all have to tell me all about how how great well, it was. In which, well, and listen, it seems like. I can say whatever I like about it because three pound forty nine is a barrier of entry that you're not willing to cross at any point in history. <laughs> it's a lot of money. I think if I'd gone SD, I think it might have been t- t- two forty nine. So I could this. have saved a pound. You, you could go SD. Yeah. Uh, I don't think. Um, <laughs> I don't think watching it in SD is going to affect your enjoyment of it. <laughs> okay. At all. That was your first film, though, wasn't it? The Love Guru. I mean, it was. You know, Mike Myers film. Yeah. And it, yeah, it, every, everything was, it must have been very exciting for you to be in. Really excited. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was, came at a very weird time because there was a writer's strike around that time in America. Right. Uh, so I was in big trouble because I was in America on a working visa and all of a sudden I'm striking, which is not great. Uh, and so then it was, this, this thing came up and luckily I could, uh, I could go up to Canada and do it, so that was what I spent some All of right. my um, some of that time doing, and it really uh, it really came in handy. Did you think when you uh, knew your character was called Dick Pants that, that it might be a bad idea? To be in the film? Was that I mean, was that a warning bell? I, I mean, when you say it like that, <laughs> you know that warning bell rings pretty loudly. But at the time, I kind of thought, "Oh, this will be great. I love Mike Myers." I'm sure this will be really funny. And I will say, you haven't seen it. There are some funny bits in it. Okay. There's a very, very funny scene where he gets attacked by a cockerel. And uh, it's good. <laughs> well, maybe. My wife, I said to my wife, it's 3.49. She said, your time's probably best spent doing something else. We could have watched it. in the, If I'd thought ahead, we could have watched it like as one of our night's entertainment. But then I might have resented you because we have we got two young kids. Yeah. I got, I, I, got, I got two young kids. Don't, don't do it. Consider this my gift of £3.49 to you. Don't, don't do it. Fair enough. Um, I've got my back. I'm quite pleased with the background. I did the white void thing. Yes, thank you. And, and it actually, if people are watching on video, it's almost, it's, it looks like we could be in the same room. It's basically seamless, isn't it? The, the, this is, I'm, in, I'm in a room adjacent to the white void, so this is, has a more greenish oh, hue, which is what you uh, managed to do there. Yeah, so it's almost like I knew you'd be next door. I thought you might. I thought you might use your studio. You never know. Uh, but it's a tribute to you, anyway. Look, I, look the first, the thing I've talked about about you a lot on this podcast before, when you've come up in a uh, conversation with other people, is my main memory of us working together. And there's a few times we worked together, and they've usually been disastrous. Was uh, a <laughs> Edinburgh preview uh, in Aldershot at the West End Centre in Aldershot. <laughs> Where I was doing uh, the twelve task circle stereos, and you and Andy were doing yeah uh, I don't know, some some you know one of your wordy political shows yes to a not very interested audience. In fact, I would say a quite angry audience of squaddies, really. In yeah, I think there's a time and a place for the wordy comedy that we were doing at the time, <laughs> and the time and place was not older shot then. That's for sure. <laughs> It's a great venue, the West End Centre, and I've done loads of great, lovely tour gigs there. But I think we'd just been booked as a comedy night, hadn't we? And they'd so it was. D- That's the problem, isn't it? I, I, I sometimes feel for those audiences because, you know, you could say that comedy is a relatively selfish exercise at the best of times. Edinburgh previews are entirely selfish. There <laughs> yes. Is, the, really, the main thing you want there is not to entertain, more to have an audience exposed the flaws in the show that you can then fix. So, um, uh, all the shot exposes a lot of flaws. <laughs> so we are both doing early Edinburgh previews. All I know is I got, you got heckled during my set because I came on and started talking about Greek gods and the guy went, oh God, not another one. <laughs> and I, but I offered him money to leave. I said, look, you're not going to enjoy this. I'll tell you right now, you're not going to enjoy it. I'll give you your money back for my half of the show and you can go. He said, don't patronise me. I'm going to stay th- like 45 seconds later. He walked out and said, oh, you could have had your money back, but you didn't. And then he came up to me nose to nose and started shouting at me. And, and with that stupid bravado of I'm on stage, I just fronted him out. He was probably in the SAS. He I definitely oh, yeah. could have really seriously hurt me. And I was being really rude to him. And he was, I, he, you know, because the, the, 
that came down onto the stage to get out and he was nose to nose with me and I fronted out and then you think if that happened in any other situation in my life there's right. no way I would stand my ground I'm sorry about that it's no the- no it wasn't your fault it was uh, it was at the fault of the universe but I often wonder if that guy remembers you and Andy and whether he's sort of seen your rise to fame and success and he sees you and thinks oh, that's that Fucking cunt from Aldershot. How's pretty, he doing so well? I am pretty sure that he would stand by his opinion that day. My opinion hasn't changed. <laughs> the world has merely shifted around me. I still think he's shit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's sort of an amazing. Uh, I mean, it's sort. Of, I mean, you're the, what's happened to you is one of those amazing success stories that I'm not saying is not deserved because it is thoroughly deserved. But you know, you we'd. We also around that same time did, I can't remember what channel it was for, but it was like a whole, it was the UK trying to do. That's what I remember. That was for More 4, I think. Yeah, right. And, uh, and, but it was like a panel. I remember it being like a room with a table that went around and there was like six or seven different acts all trying to sort of chip in and talk about the news. Then we did some video bits. But again, that, that was the UK attempting to do what it took you to go to America to yeah. do it properly. I so they, few, they had... I did a few... It was around the time that uh, yeah. they were often saying that we want to do a version of The Daily Show and then we're doing a version of that, which is like a very, very offensive impression. <laughs> that was really bad. All I remember from that was being pretty miserable over the week. I think Mark Dolan was hosting it, right? And I, th- I remember I feeling very frustrated. And then I, was, I think I might be sitting next to you and there were satsumas on the table and you were drawing a penis and balls on the satsuma and turning it yeah. out towards the camera. And I actually <laughs> felt a real sense of relief from you doing that. Thinking, oh, good. Richard is treating this with exactly the respect that this occasion <laughs> deserves. It was a non-broadcast thing, I think, wasn't it? But it, <laughs> I think maybe it was broadcast. Was it broadcast? I think it was I broadcast. Don't... I think it was broadcast. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, Mark Dolan, who's gone, I don't know if you followed Mark Dolan's uh, career path, but he's been uh, on talk radio cutting up masks. He's turned into an anti-masker. On, really? Uh, on, yeah, on talk radio, he's turned into one of those guys. So, you yeah, know, again, it's the, it's interesting the way careers yeah. t- <laughs> turn off at different points. There he was, the host of that show. He didn't so, well, seem to Mark- give a shit. Uh, as host of that show, which is one of the, the key problems, right? It felt like he was—he seemed to be good at, at hosting shows. But if you're hosting yeah. a show like that one, you kind of want to have some connection to the material. And he had none. He was willing to Ron Burgundy whatever was in the order queue in front of him. And that, that is, that is kind of the problem. You have to give people, if you want to do a show like that, like The Daily Show, you yeah. have to give editorial control and have like a singular authorial voice otherwise it's just not going to work so when you went to the daily show did they do do you, do you feel they did it better than the more <laughs> for do they had a better idea of how to put better. together that kind yeah, of yeah i think yeah it was, it was better, better. yeah it's better. I'm not... Did you go, hey, I did a show in the UK and I, I think there's some lessons to learn. I think you're missing a satsuma <laughs> on the desk with um with a penis and balls drawn in felt tip and then angled towards the camera, <laughs> quietly, but defiantly. Maybe that's what blew it for me. Maybe they watched that. So we're going to have one of these guys, we're going to take him over to the Daily Show. Oh, that guy drew a, a cock and balls. We can't have him. We can't. Have, he was the one. He was the standout guy. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, from Aldershot and from that, it's, that it's this amazing sort of... And, and, and I think when you were working in the UK, you were obviously doing lots of great stuff, but it, and, and Edinburgh shows and, uh, and uh, the podcast as well. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, it felt like you were undervalued. I think on the circuit, people would feel like this is a guy who's good. <laughs> And should think, be should be doing should be doing better than they're doing. I think the problem then, is that it, I was at that point where there, there is unhelpfully a kind of friction between you and the audience when you're not quite good enough at doing the thing that you want to be doing that you can effectively sell what you're doing to an audience that doesn't really want it. If that makes sense. <laughs> but you were it was what you what you and Andy especially were doing together was always really interesting and the political animal shows and the. Uh, uh, and all those Edinburgh shows you were putting together were were 
were very interesting. I mean, I remember on that that more four show, it's like you had a very tightly scripted, like very dense thing you would do. You'd scripted a conversation to each other that was so fast and dense. That I was yeah. sitting there going, "Fucking hell, this is you know, it's good." But <laughs> is anyone going to is anyone at yeah. home going to be following this? This is this is full on stuff. It was you know, but it but then to suddenly i mean not not by chance exactly but like to get picked up by an american show was sort of a bit of a bolt from the blue right oh it was a complete i mean i think it was a little bit by chance um because yeah andy and i are the radio shows that we were working on have been canned so we we were <laughs> we were in trouble uh and then kind of out of nowhere like came this like this invitation to go and uh, meet with the Daily Show, uh, and J- John Stewart had kind of been the north star of what what we'd been thinking of trying to do, like this very, very uh, thoughtful editorial, um, but committed satire, and so to get to spend any time with him was pretty thrilling, and then to realise that oh yeah, if you do it this way, if you take it as seriously as he does, if you work as hard as he has to, um, you can actually do something amazing. But he had to really fight for his editorial independence. Uh, That was kind of one of the many things that I admire about him was that it wasn't handed to him on a plate. In in a sense, I've had it easier because having gone from there and then to HBO where independence is kind of their MO, it's been easier for me. He had to fight to get that from Comedy Central when he first took over that show. Sure. And that, I mean, that is the, the, that's the success of those shows. And because they feel, I mean, I can't imagine, you know, like pitching your current show uh, last week tonight to like someone in the UK, we're going to, we're going to go, you know, we're going to talk for, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes about a hard hitting subject. I just can't see anyone going for it. And, and, you know, and I'm going to choose what the, the stuff subjects are. And me and my team are going to choose the subjects and you're not going to have anything to do with it. And we can talk about anything we want. The idea of that getting accepted is kind of crazy. And you can sort of see why they would think that, but then it's been such a successful show. Yeah, because been... because of that, because of that, because of that, you know, it's authored by you and your your team, but it's you know it's very much your your thing, um, and it's not diluted down like like so many of these you know so many things. Even I, I just did a thing for Comic Relief with Joan and Jericho, which is people doing pod clashes, and they were coming back and telling us what we could and couldn't do on that, you know, and it was yeah they do, they booked uh, they booked, booked Joan and Jerrica who were kind of you know offensive agony aunts and then going, Yeah, but that's a bit offensive what you said, going, Yeah, that's so, you know, even when <laughs> even right. the charity thing that, that people are coming in, yeah, because would that be acceptable? So Yeah. It's you know, it's an amazing thing to have have, have got that. It's amazing. Um, I, re- I really don't take there is no point at which I take it for granted because I know how rare it is, how lucky I am to be able to work under these conditions, which is why I think I'm compelled to want to work so hard. That's it, because it feels like, you know, on behalf of all the people that would look at a position like that and think, oh man, if I got to do anything that I wanted, I would want to work really hard, not be lazy like that. So I think that's why we work such long hours to try and get these complicated shows right. Because uh, yeah. it feels like um, it would be pretty fucking ungrateful not to do that. It does seem like that's a very uh, that's a very American work ethic, though. In that, then uh, when I've seen you and other people talking to people like Seinfeld, I've, I listened to you talking to uh, Conan O'Brien, I think uh, today on a podcast, and it's that desire to to work, which I think you know, it, well, that Mark Dolan thing probably shows up perfectly. It's that coming, getting an opportunity, even though it's more for and even though it's nothing, and not going fuck. Let's grasp this. Let's yeah. try and make this. Let's, let's and just read the article. As many go. jokes as we can, Andy. Let's talk too fast for people to <laughs> fully pick it up in a tone that's completely at odds with what everyone else is doing around the table. <laughs> it's not a recipe for success, but it is more like there is real excitement to it. So I think yeah. that I, I I get. Excited! That we, I, I'm lucky to have such a an amazing team of people that I work with now that I am gen, genuinely pretty excited by the end to try and sell this thing to people. 
that um, sure. we've been working on for some time, well, it's, a month and a half. It's complicated. And, like, you know, it's interesting watching it from the UK because, you know, a lot of the stories obviously are worldwide, but some of the stories are very American based. But it's really interesting to find out about employment, the employment, uh, <laughs> unemployment benefit and stuff in the United States and how that works. Uh, and, and really interesting to hear that. I do notice you, and you sort of started doing this, was it 2014 you started? doing last week's so that was it that or was that the daily show i think that's you've right. been doing it for yeah, a good while six the daily show so yeah it must have been 2014 yeah. yeah yeah and then it's pretty much since you started doing that that the world's gone really to shit which either proves satire doesn't work at all or i think more likely that you have been going around causing problems so that you can do some <laughs> some good material in your <laughs> show i think history has proven that satire doesn't work if what you think Working means is <laughs> well, it doesn't, systems all these good, fall, then yeah, it doesn't, make, it doesn't yeah. work in that sense. <laughs> you're making all these good points about stuff, but things have just got worse and worse since you've been on air, I would say. 2014, if everyone had taken it, go, how's it going? Pretty good. Yeah, 2000, pretty good. It's pretty, like we just had the London Olympics, that was good, and Obama's in, it's pretty good. It's, I think yeah. it's going pretty well. And then you took over, and then we slide down. Um, yeah, it's hard to push back <laughs> but, on that. <laughs> no, I was. I mean, no, I would know we've been emailing each other every now and again over the last few years. Yeah. And when Trump got in, and you've done a lot of takedowns of Trump and a, you know a lot of really valid stuff. But for all sort of satirists in America, and I certainly as a foreign satirist in America, I kind of wondered whether you, I was a bit scared for you. I kind of thought anything yeah. could happen the next four years. Were you? Were you? Did it scare you that? Like, did we? Did you feel like? physically in danger or did you just crack on with stuff you know what it might actually go back to a little of what you were saying uh, about your kind of adopted bravery on stage in yeah. older shot it might come it might come from a little bit from the same place which is you yeah. get this slightly false sense of defiance and defending the territory that you stand on that you might that maybe i wouldn't if i didn't have a platform if that makes sense yeah um so yeah i was yeah, I was kind of, I was quietly very concerned about my immigration status, just because yeah. he's such a famously, consistently vindictive man. Uh, yeah. And that you know that once you've irritated him once, you kind of have an enemy for life. And if your enemy <laughs> happens to be the president, <laughs> and you've also <laughs> pissed off his extended family, you're probably not crazy to think the consequences could come from that. But um, well, it felt like his whole presidential campaign was a, just because of that president's speech dinner with the Obama did, where he took the piss out, and you saw him stewing in the audience and thinking, "This is the moment he decided I'm going to do it," and I'm, I'm going to. It felt like his whole presidency was just I'm going to undo everything that Obama did, and it felt to me like this is is retaliation for you daring to joke about me. I mean, he so he, he, if he, he could, he had kind of dipped his toe into running for president almost every presidential cycle, just because, he, I mean, the man loves attention to a genuine yeah. character fault. Uh, and um, so, yeah, he's, I mean, when, when he jumped in, we, we had actually ignored him until we did our main kind of biography piece about him the uh, Sunday before Super Tuesday. And the, the only point of doing that was to say, because at that point it seemed like he was going to win Super Tuesday. And... Uh, historically, if you win Super Tuesday, you're the nominee. And yeah. so it felt like it was right on the tipping point from, oh, here's this P.T. Barnum figure um, right, enjoying the process of running for office and saying, in 48 hours, if he wins this thing, he's the nominee and everything changes. <laughs> so that was when we first <clears throat> kind of engaged with him. But yeah, it was, a, it was a very difficult time to be writing comedy, partly because... It's difficult writing as the years went by from such a level of despair because the stuff yeah. that he was stirring up was so ugly um, that, yeah, it's, it, it takes a toll. You know, write, writing yeah. jokes from, from, from a point of utter despair is something <laughs> you can do a bit. If you do it a lot, it kind of can cut into you a bit. 
So yeah, I'm well, so it's glad. it's been a very. I mean, like, and I, you know, I'd love to say, oh, look at you, bad luck going to America where everything's crazy, but it's it's not been any better here. Uh, and you know, and then with you know, COVID coming on the tail end of all of that as well, and 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 then you need to broadcast from your home in a yeah. studio. I mean, it's it's amazing you've and great that you've carried on doing that, and it's it's terrific that it works. It's been still. amazing. Yeah, I've been. I mean, yeah. the thing is that uh, it's been utterly exhausting. Uh, and very yeah. just practically difficult doing it with two little kids around, especially yes. early on. But I am immensely grateful. One, because the thing I was most worried about at the start was if we have to furlough this, I'm responsible for like a weirdly large amount of people on payroll. So I was very anxious yes, yes. just that my staff kept getting paid. So we had to keep trying to do the show. That was almost the primary objective. Like, I yeah, need yeah. to pay these people. So we have to find a way to keep doing something that resembles our show to an extent that we can keep. It was as reductive as that. Then, as time went on, it was definitely stressful. But I'm really grateful that I got to do it because I, I, I do worry about where my head would have gone in the absence of having these deadlines and this yeah, outlet. Yeah. I think I, I might have sunk into a pretty dark place. Yeah, I guess that's true. You know, similarly, I mean, on a slightly smaller scale, <laughs> you know, being able to carry on doing all this stupid stuff I've been doing here from home is just... The thing is, yeah, it's not a small it's... scale. We're operating on exactly <laughs> the same scale. <laughs> Maybe. But, uh, you know, in terms of what we're doing, but yeah, yeah it's, it's, you know, it's been, I guess it has, it has been really great to have that distraction. And, you yeah. know, I've sort of, it's been a weird year and the last couple of months have been doubly weird, but it's, you know, I've sort of enjoyed... Uh, it more than most people would have been, would have done so. I think because, and as a performer, my wife said, and I, I wasn't doing that much stand up, but I was doing this on stage, you know, this show on stage. And my wife says, if I don't go on stage for three months, and I become a sort of a bit of a nightmare to live with. Just the, you know, or the, at least once I go back on stage, I'm nicer. To, you know, yeah, I can get that. That out. might be and a so better way of framing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm not the worst. I'm not like the worst. I'm always on comet yeah. comedian, but I think there's just something in the performance kind of gives you a bit of you know energy and life. And yeah, and I think if it, there'd been nothing to do, it, it's a sort of depressing enough stuff thing going on already. And that distraction, and also again with your show as well, the idea you know that you're there's people watching it, and that yeah. weekly that coming up weekly is a sort of highlight for the, the viewers. You know, that's that was a it was. I felt very grateful that. Right, to the extent that this, like this, for the last 15 years, I've kind of been so embedded in current affairs. And so I've been kind of to a drown inducing extent. And it's kind of been mentally my best outlet to kind of work out how I feel and how I should feel about things has been trying to create comedy through it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, with, with the last year being so difficult in so many ways, with the pandemic and other things that were happening in, in America, like having a staff that, you know, the, where, we, where we can try and work out how we feel about something and try and add know, some protein to sometimes the horse shit that was going around. It was, uh, it, I think at the time I was so tired, I couldn't really see the wood for the trees. But by the end of last year, I could kind of look back and go, I can't believe you all managed to keep everything going the way you did and yeah, to, well, and to, and to was... kind of keep an outlet of a, a show that was interesting and also just constantly stupid as well. Because <laughs> I wasn't sure how, how we'd be able to do some of the really, really silly things that are the most joyful thing for, for us to do on the show. I wasn't sure, especially in April, when things in New York were really bad... Yeah. I, I wasn't sure the extent to which there was going to be any appetite for stupidity. And um, and when we started to work out that we were going to be able to do a different kind of very stupid thing, it was uh, yeah, kind of head saving. It was yeah. so great. Well, I think like the thing with the getting the, the sewer plant yeah, named after you and all of that stuff that led to that, just like picking on a town and getting really angry with the children of the town. <laughs> and, th and threatening to fight them and stuff, or are saying, come and fight me. It was, you know, it's joyful. And then for you to, you know, and for them to come round and it, name the plant It was amazing, was actually. Because it's objectively, all it is is stupid. But yeah. 
underneath that, for me, because my faith in humanity was taking a few whacks last year, both politically and especially in terms of the way that America was responding to the pandemic. So as crazy as it sounds, doing that one joke, having like a, a mayor decide to pick up and run with it in a way that was kind of genuinely interesting and managing to push it uphill, the joke delicately, while funneling HBO's production money to Food Banks at the time. I remember standing in that, it, like at that uh, sewage plant when we were going to film that little bit and kind of, it was the first time I'd been anywhere that was not my house and <laughs> feeling so happy. <laughs> No, we did it. I don't know what we did, but we did it. <laughs> and so at the beginning of the year, if someone said you're going to go to a sewer plant and be happy as you've been all year, you'd have gone, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's it's terrific. Um, and, uh, well, it, but all the, the, I suppose, you know, I, I I kind of thought you might get dragged out of your bed and, and you know, taken away uh, by, by thugs but i guess um you a you you've not really shied away from confrontation in your previous work anyway so i was re-watching the bit about the uh, gun control that you yeah. did with the daily show where you you know you're very bold in the face of, of... In those, only in those moments though it is a very different side of me it's yeah. the same as you and older shot like i don't yeah i yeah i i, I when it comes to work i guess i am fearless which is uh, odd because I'm so fearful and I'm so anxious most of the time yeah. in my life that yes yeah, something comes over me whereas yeah I don't um, I don't uh, I don't fear anything <laughs> yeah. and do you think I mean your wife's uh, worked in the army and was a medic yeah. in the army yeah and obviously has seen some things that are properly yeah. unpleasant yeah uh, do you think that gives you a sense of perspective with your comedy a little <laughs> so bit yeah I think, otherwise not I think I always had this like slight, slight mental shift even early on with the daily show that uh, yeah uh, where where in those interviews like my heart rate would go down and I'd kind of disassociate <laughs> and would be able to do like do my job to a decent level without yeah. letting kind of guilt <laughs> come in. Basically, Colbert used to say, you just turn your soul, you hang your soul up on a hook at, uh, at the start of the interview. And that was, I was able to do that. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, with my, with my wife, like the situation she was in, in Fallujah was so bad that, yeah, it definitely, if I needed a, uh, <laughs> uh, a sense of reality injected in me, uh, <laughs> then that's a pretty heavy injection. I think I saw, uh, one of the podcasts that I heard you say, you'd done a gig and you, kept, you and your wife said, it's like a war zone out there. Yeah, went, she, no, yeah no, she, didn't, she didn't like that. She doesn't like that turn of phrase. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I, think, Let me ask I, think I, I think I even said as well, I think I tried to defend myself for a second. Before, so I think it might have been before I saw her face. Went, well, you know, there's bodies everywhere. She went, it's not the same. Think of a different... <laughs> Different, like, Think of a different it's phrase. Like, Isn't that what you're supposed like, to do for a li living? <laughs> it's like working in older shot out there, is what you could have said. That would, it's like doing a gig in older shot. I'll ask some emergency questions yeah. because people will be upset if I don't. I'm going to go right back to the beginning. Um, I'm going to, I haven't asked this question for a long time, but okay. I think you are the kind of man. Didn't I didn't ask Jeremy Pax from this question, and I wish I had. John Oliver, have you ever tried to suck your own cock? Wait, you didn't ask Jeremy Pack from that question? I didn't. Is, I, is, that I because it, is that because the answer is assumed? <laughs> yeah. He's got a very big cock, apparently. That's, that's... So, that... you know, I don't know if that makes it easier or harder. I think it's... I don't think it's necessarily penis size. I think it's back flexibility is the uh, Do, issue yeah. there, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Any luck for I John haven't, Oliver? I haven't tried no? to do that. Wow. What did you ask Jeremy Paxman? Was there, um, was there a, a question adjacent to that that you... <laughs> I asked him would he'd rather have a handmaid have a out of hammer or an armpit that dispenses sun cream because I hoped he would just keep going, what are you talking about? And then I could go, answer the question, answer the question. But he, he answered it quite quickly. He answered it after about three times. It, what did he want? Uh, he wanted the... I think he wanted the sun cream. Well, good for him for giving a straight would, answer. Yeah, yeah, it's a straight answer. He didn't even need to any of the rules explained. He just went for it. Have you got a preference between a handmade out of hammer or a, a sun cream? a sun cream armpit you get like a year supply of sun cream for you or the ham handle grow back uh but slowly i'll take the sun you, cream yeah yeah yep. it's a popular choice 
Is it, is it sunny out? Do, do you need that in uh, New York when you're in New York? Do you need uh, I mean, sun cream? I don't know what about me screams outdoor kid. Which <laughs> it can be sunny outside. It can be snowing outside. This kid's indoors. <laughs> I will... No, you don't need the sun cream. should have had the ham. I'll ask you a new emergency question based on my recent experience. If you had to have uh, part of your body uh, extracted, <laughs> but you could choose the part, but if you didn't have it, you'd be killed if you didn't do it. But you can choose the part. Um, which part? And I, there are some stipulations. If you choose fingers, you lose all your... If you can't just have a finger, it has to be a sizable part. All your fingers go. If you choose teeth, it's all your teeth go. Uh, uh, it's got to be if there's more than two of them. If there's two of them, you can have just one of them removed. Which body part would you will, willingly give up? It's got to be useful. It can't be the appendix. Oh, so useful. that was that was literally what I was going to say. That you can't yeah, no appendix. You can't say that one. The appendix is there's you, no, you're not allowed the appendix. Hmm. What would you have taken off? And this this really is you projecting your current situation <laughs> to everyone you speak to, isn't it? It is. It is. But do, I think. Do you want me to say testicle, Rich? Is I do, but I think testicle's the right answer. Yeah. I think if I had to have one thing taken out. Yeah. Because I think, like. And you a did. Kidney, you did, I have, did have it taken I out. I did, Rich. but I didn't want you to did. do it. I think you could take it one ear. I think you, I might allow you one ear, but it would have to be the whole. Well, you still. Listen, you're, you're a man for whom, you know, testicles have been. For the, the male anatomy has been such a muse for you. It's. it's I know. It's. It's, 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 it's the. It's, <laughs> The, the male anatomy to you has been what Stormy sees were to JMW Turner. You, do, you can see <laughs> so many different colours and shades of them. <laughs> it feels like I'm being punished. And I think I'm being punished by my balls for, for not for concentrating too much on the penis, which is a, is a common problem uh, in, in lovemaking, that people concentrate too much on the penis, and my comedy have too much on the penis, not enough balls. And I think this is the revenge I'll... of... I'll okay. take a. I'll, I'll I'll lose a testicle in solidarity yeah. with you, Rich, cool. and, and I'll, still... you, I'll lose the opposite one as well. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so we can work together. <laughs> Maybe we could somehow just fuse like Siamese twin ourselves together right there. Yep. We'd make a super penis out of that. We could have a super penis made of our two penises grafted together, <laughs> and we have the right number of balls, <laughs> and then you know it'd be complicated, but I think it's worth spoken worth doing. like a true serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here's a there's a classier question. I'll yeah. give you a classy question. Uh, if you uh, if all the world's art galleries and museums oh. got together and said we love John Oliver, we're going to let him have one thing out of all our art galleries or museums that he can take home and keep. Which object object of art or history or whatever would you take from all the world's art galleries and museums? Just that one. A great question. It is good, isn't it? It's exciting. It's it's uh, you get learn a lot from the art. You learn a lot about it's from a, the answer. It's answer a great here. question. I mean, your previous two were so bad that you've kind of really <laughs> effectively set a low bar that makes this seem like oh boy, we're a we're kind of we're in nineteenth uh, century France discussing around the table <laughs> with a chiton cigarette. Um, oh. You've got time. You don't have to rush. It's fine. I'm trying to think of the things. Is it so? It, it probably works better if it's something that I've seen and that really. Well, it can be. I think if it's something, but you know, you could so go see. Like, I'll, I'll I'll let you into the question. Mm -hmm. Some people, because you know, you won't you won't know how to interview people. So I'll try and give you some lessons. Um, some people will choose something valuable so they can sell it. Yeah. Some people will choose something that means a lot to them oh, personally, right. yeah, or that just that they really like. So you know, it's but then that tells. And some people. I want someone chose the uh, donations box at the museum <laughs> the people for the money. <laughs> what? That was a good choice. I can't even remember who that was. That was good. Um, think, you know what? I might, I might go with something by Anthony Gormley. Oh yes, I, I really loved that. I can't. Was it Horizons? That I think it was. Might have been either just after or just before I left for America. He did a Horizons exhibition where the figures were standing all over the South Bank, and you stood on the yeah, yeah, that was great. He he did it again. He did a version of it here in New York, actually, and it was, it was still great, but slight, it caused slightly more trouble just because the buildings are higher, you see things yeah. up there, and it's just a lot of the police getting called saying someone's about to jump. And the answer was, no, it's art. I went, okay. <laughs> um, I, it, might, it, might be, and it might be like an Anthony Gormley figure 
I think they're. Still and you could have the Angel of the North in your house, in your garden. I don't want Angel of the North. That should stay there. <laughs> I don't want to take that. I just want to take an Angel because there's lots of those as well. <laughs> yeah. That or, or you know what? The, there was when I was at university, the Cambridge Museum had this amazing little picture by William Blake uh, called "Christ Child Asleep on the Cross." Have you ever okay. seen that? It's kind of Rings amazing. There's a baby lying down on a cross on the floor, and then the two right. parents are kind of just looking horrified. That's <laughs> and uh, that that was that's pretty good. I loved William Blake. Yeah. I'd take that. I'd take an Anthony Gormley or that William Blake. Thank good you. choices. Very good. Um, right. Let me talk to you about your career. It was nice to ask. You. Have you ever seen a ghost? Though I should ask you if you've ever seen a ghost, John Oliver. I'm just assuming no. So no, but <laughs> okay. I but. remember once as a kid, I think we were on holiday. I think we were in Malvern, and I think my I remember my dad saying, "If you oh, there's gnomes around here. If you see a gnome, you can have a sweet." And I remember looking out the kitchen window, and I was so desperately trying to visualise a gnome. I swear, I saw like this sweep of colour. I remember going to my dad and saying, "I saw a gnome," and seeing the kind of look on his face of, I mean, could, I don't think you did. I went, I, I I think I saw a gnome. And I need that fucking sweet right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't, I haven't seen a ghost. I don't yeah. think I've seen a gnome. But <laughs> at one point in my life, I was 100% convinced that I just had. I think that might be a good new emergency quest. I might ask next Andy Osho next week if she's seen a gnome and see. I, do, I think for most people, it's not going to get much. But the, occasionally someone's going to go, fuck yeah. I mean, if I'd asked you it, you'd have shat yourself, wouldn't you? But there you go. That is, <laughs> yes, Rich, the way. I have. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have my sweet there? <laughs> it's a sweet. So, look, I, hey, I really... Uh, you're in, like, t- two of my all-time favourite sitcoms st- slash... Really? I don't know if Rick and Morty counts as a, oh, yeah, right. as a sitcom. Rick and Morty yeah. and Community. Yeah. Both by Dan Harmon. Yeah. And, but, yeah. like, you, so you, you had to make some interesting choices. You were obviously, you went to America and you started getting offered a lot of work. <laughs> and you got offered Community, uh, but you wanted to carry on doing The Daily Show. So that's yeah. why you're not in Community as yeah. much as you might have been, right? Yeah, I really like them. But, yeah, but, I mean, yeah. The Daily Show was my dream job. I know lots of people use The Daily Show perfectly fine to, to go and do the jobs that they really wanted to do whereas it yeah. was what that was my favorite thing I wanted to do that <laughs> sure. so I was kind of very keen not to kind of get distracted by other stuff and then when um when community came up I did like the look of it and I yeah. really liked Dan Harmon and so uh, I did the pilot kind of thinking well these things never get picked up anyway then it got picked up and then they were nice enough to kind of work around my schedule so whenever I had a holiday from the Daily Show, I would go and do an episode or two of Community. Sure. Yeah. And how was it? Because he's he's notoriously a little bit difficult, uh, Dan Harmon. Or did you? But is that only with people who rub him up the wrong way? I love <laughs> him. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I love him. I don't know him at all, but I, he's absolutely. I think you know he's created two of my absolute yeah. time favourite. I mean, he is. I think he will be first to say that. Um, He's not a perfect human being, uh, <laughs> uh, but as a uh, as a writer, he's amazing. Um, and so, yeah, it was chaotic at times. I mean, I, I I never had to suffer the full chaos of that set because yeah. I just wasn't there all the time. So I would occasionally get go back there, having been away for seven or eight weeks, and you would just see kind of a thousand yard stare on everyone that was working there. But the the thing that was really inspiring about it was just how hard he and everyone there worked so hard like to make it yeah. just by degree upon degree upon degree better and that it wasn't just him it was the, the writers also um the, the set designers there's so many tiny jokes there so it was uh, the, the, even the, the directors that would come in everything was set up to spend an immense amount of energy on a sitcom that at the time nobody was watching. So <laughs> it was, uh, it was a, I loved it. It was a really inspiring place to be. I'm glad that finally there is a kind of second wave of people coming to it. Because at the time it was constantly on the edge of being cancelled. It never quite had yeah, enough yeah. people to justify its own existence, which was what was so exciting about it in a way as well, in that you can't quite believe that they're getting away with it. Yeah. 
Well, I've watched them a lot. We watch we, My wife loves it as well. We do tend to kind of go back to sitcoms we like. So I've seen it a lot. And it's like when you come back to it, though, you sort of, you, you know, you, A, you're amazed by that cert- certain plot lines are in the same show, right? You think, oh, that's the one about this. And then you go, fuck, there's also the one about this and this. Like the, the, one, of the, <laughs> the one I really love is uh, the one about who's the boss, who is the boss. And you kind of think, oh, that was a big plot line in that show. You look and it's a tiny, yeah. tiny part of the show, but it's so good. That's, that's uh, but- what's so amazing about it. It felt like, because it's all in 21 minutes, like a 30-minute like yeah. show is 21 minutes in America. So, yeah, to, to manage to get it that dense. Like, I've always liked really dense comedy. That yeah. you just, because there are there are m- jokes, flyby jokes in Community that other shows would do like a three episode arc on, and it's gone sure. in like you say ninety seconds. It's yeah. amazing. Uh, so yeah, yeah I, I, it was a really great. And with Rick and Morty, it's like, I don't know what the process with something like that is. Is that just you're going in for you going for a day and read a piece and then walk away? And yeah, that's, I mean, it that's hadn't it. even that was just the next thing he was working on. So I, yeah. there, there was no animation at that point. That was just. Him in LA, me in a sound booth in New York, right. um, making some ridiculous sounds, and then <laughs> him saying, oh, I'll tell you when it's finished. <laughs> so honestly, it's so I, had, good. I, I, I had not watched Rick and Morty until relatively recently. It was only when a few yeah. writers on our show went, you know, this thing's incredible, right? <laughs> so then I started watching and had that same feeling of, oh, yeah. God, there is a lot in this. There really is. There really is. Oh, it's very exciting. And, you know, to top it all, Vanity Smurf in the, <laughs> the Smurfs films. I mean, that must have been... <laughs> I mean, that must have put everything into perspective when you got that. Both films as well. They, they had you back for the second film. I think I've seen them. Mm. I've seen a lot of kids' films. They and, I, you know, I, they're, they're... Well, it's like the Trolls. I was very... thought I thought the Trolls films aren't going to be good, but they're pretty good. This, I think the Smurfs is all right, isn't it? Is it okay or is it not any good, John? Um, I well, haven't. Be, um, I haven't seen it. Okay. Uh, so I can't say for sure. And I got busted. Uh, I got busted on not having seen it with the second one. <laughs> it was because yeah, you say I was invited back for the second one. The way those contracts work, you do one, <laughs> you're on the hook. <laughs> Who was it? I'm. I'm just trying to look it up now. <laughs> who was it? Who was Papa Smurf? Oh, that's right. That's right. So I, I was. I went in for the. <laughs> I went in for the second one, and like they yeah. played in a voice. I went, "Oh, that's Jonathan Winters. How did you get Jonathan Winters for this?" They went, "He was in the first one too." And oh yeah, yeah, totally. Of course he was. I mean, how did you get him to come back? Oh, it would have been the, back. The, contractually. The contract. The contract. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? We all know what happened here. <laughs> there's a there's it's an amazing cast. I looked at it at IMDb. Katy Perry. Well, you've worked with Katy Perry and Beyonce. You've worked with Beyonce. Yes, I've worked you with both of them, and and of course neither of them because again, <laughs> you're in a booth alone. I will say there is a like a, a really, a, it's a, there's a fantastic. I think you know what. And now I'm trying to remember why I did the Smurfs, and I, now I remember it was literally to make Andy laugh because I was doing the bugle at the time. <laughs> and I thought, great, <laughs> do the voice of a Smurf. <laughs> this is something we can enjoy for a long time. <laughs> then did you do any rep? It did well <laughs> enough for a second one. <laughs> and then they say, oh, we've written Vanity Smurf in as a bigger role. And you go, ah, oh, fuck. This joke is really blowing up in my face now. What, uh, what research did you do for, before you, you took on the part of Vanity Smurf? Well, I mean... You've got to take any role seriously, right? Sure. So um, you want to try and get into the head of Vanity Smurf as much. So I you went back to those lots of those Greek Narcissus texts. You, you want <laughs> yes. to really work out why Vanity Smurf is like this um, and why he carries a mirror around all the time <laughs> to peer upon his own reflection. What floor is in him that needs that what hunger yeah. needs to be filled so I mean whether that comes out in the performance doesn't matter it was there and did you listen to the Smurfs the Smurf, the single by the Smurfs where are you all coming I'd have, I'd have been start, sorry I'd have been starting there, so there are so many fun moments there when you when you as an adult are in a like a really expensive sound booth and then behind the glass there's other adults 
saying, okay, so now all the other Smurfs are coming in, so can you make a noise like you're happy? You're going, fuck yeah, I can. This is what, if someone had told me this is what a gr- being a grown-up was going to be like, I'd have welcomed it. Yeah, so, so they did say at the end, and now they've, uh, <laughs> they were, no, we, if you can do the Smurf song, we're gonna, there's a big song at the end, so if you can just sing it, and then we'll mix it in. Uh, at the end, and I said, are you going to mix it down so Katy Perry's louder? And silence. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> but you also, with your Daily Show, I think it might, might have been, I think it was the Daily Show time, you had a chance to be in the, the basically a Monty Python film, and you turned that down. Is that true? I read that you were that? offered the part... And absolutely, yeah, the Terry Jones film with all the Monty Python guys in absolutely anything. I, yes. I read that you were offered that part. I think, I don't know in, entirely how uh, the movie industry works. You can, you can go back through my history <laughs> of films. <laughs> but uh, Terry Jones, who I was one of my absolute heroes growing sure. up, he came to New York and he said, oh, do you want to have breakfast? And so I went out for breakfast with him and he said, I've written a script, Will you, uh, do you want to be in it? So I just said yes. And then next thing I know, <laughs> there was like some headline saying, oh, Terry Jones' film with uh, like John Oliver attached is in it. So I had to kind of go into John Stewart's office. And went, I, had, I, had, I just said yes. I'm not, I don't know when this is happening. And he said, don't worry about it, they're just trying to raise money. And then yeah. I, think, I think he said, and your name's attached, so it's not going to happen. <laughs> he was, and he wasn't fucking wrong. But, uh. So the nice thing was, was um, for the year that that was in kind of develop, that Terry was developing that, um, I got to kind of just exchange emails with him over that year. And he's, it was such a fantastic man. He was so clever. Yeah. So sweet, so thoughtful. And so, yeah, when he passed away, it was kind of nice going back through emails and, and like, he, he would just send little recommendations for, oh, have you read this? It's often medieval poetry. The guy likes <laughs> medieval poetry. Yeah. Have you read this? No, Terry. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and if you're sending me the best, I think I'm standing by my instinct. <laughs> but... Yeah, it was it was just absolutely amazing to spend a little bit of time with him. I, I saw him again um, when Monty Python did a, a like a Q and A, all of them before a screening of it might have been Life of Brian. I, I can't remember, and um, he was starting to fade a little bit there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But God, he was, uh, what a fantastic, incredibly funny man. Yes, he was. He was. Uh, I've met him a couple of times, but not really in any uh, uh, proper way. But I sort of met him when I was a student when he was doing a book signing, and uh, but then I, and I gave him after the Python, um, you know, the live shows they did. He won a Chortle Award, and I ended up because who I was meant to award it to him didn't turn up, so I ended up giving him this this uh, Chortle Award. He was, he, I remember during that breakfast, it took me so long, like a, a full half an hour of the to- the first half an hour of being able to really concentrate uh, yeah. on what he was saying just because I couldn't believe his face and voice was in front <laughs> of me and uh, it was uh, I, and just as I'd started to relax he was talking about how hot it was outside uh, and he went oh, I've not been this hot since you know years ago with the guys we had to direct this film and it was uh, we, we had to we were making it look like somewhere else but we were shooting in North Africa and I'm thinking yeah life of fucking Brian I know what you're talking about. <laughs> the seminal comedy film of my childhood, Terry. All right, now yes. I can't concentrate on my omelette anymore. <laughs> it is sort of, I mean, no, it's, I know what a big comedy fan you were, and I read that you'd a, sort of accidentally been shown Life of Brian at school, right? Yes, by a teacher. it was amazing. Yeah. By a t- yeah, li- li- a, like a supply teacher, who uh, I think that was the case, who came in and it was just like, I'll put this on in front of the kids and then either left or wasn't listening. I remember, yeah, 45 minutes in thinking, there's no way you should have shown us this. And this (laughs) is the greatest thing I've ever seen. (laughs) But yeah, so I mean, I'm this, I I interviewed Michael Palin last, in the last live gig I did back in March last year, I interviewed Michael Palin, which was just like that, you know, and I saw, I think I said to him at the end, I can die happy now, this, this is it. (laughs) <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's difficult because you know that they don't want to hear it. 
<laughs> but you, um, and there's, so there's no real point in saying it, but if, yeah. when it matters that much to you, <laughs> it's very, very hard not to say, oh, <laughs> I feel like you might have fundamentally changed the direction of my life. Anyway, do you want a yogurt? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Um, <laughs> let me have a look. Uh, the the other thing I was there was one other. Uh, uh, maybe it was the Lion King. I was gonna. I was gonna. Oh, the the story I enjoyed again from your early days. I would write. I've been talking about all the good things you've done, which is very unlike me. Um, <laughs> I, I, you had. Uh, I remember plenty, you talking about, plenty of things for you to slap me with. There are. There, I'm going to find some things to yeah. slap me down. And this is. You talked about having a hundred percent walkout at the Edinburgh Fringe, yes. in one of your Edinburgh Fringe shows, which yeah. is pretty pretty impressive. Yeah, well, it is impressive if <laughs> if you start with a large number. If you start with four, it's not that impressive, is it? That's just yeah. that's just two couple, one couple making the easy decision, <laughs> one asshole abandoning his wife to the really hard decision. <laughs> <laughs> and did you? Was there any part of you thought I should carry on or I should wait in case anyone comes yes, back? Yes, definitely. Did, yeah. And also, it's not the only time it happened. Andy and I had a 100% walkout at, I think, he could verify this. I think it was an Edinburgh preview at The Space. Do you remember The Space? Do you remember yeah. we used to do them there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I we had a 100% walkout there too. Right, yes. Yeah. But I then that might... that's, that's less lonely because I'm on stage with someone. Uh, that's right. I think I might have been... Wasn't that, though, I think I might have followed you at that one. I think I might have been on after you at that one as well. Because <laughs> I think there was the football on or something. Wasn't there a, yes. there was a time where it was the World Cup was on? That's right. So there was literally no one coming to those shows. The, uh, so, some of my favourite um, some of my favorite gigs on the network were in student unions, where you would have some ENTS officer not really understanding what they're about to do as a football game is on the screen they'll say oh no we'll just turn it off when I, you can but you're going to hear a noise and that noise is going to turn into hostility and that hostility is what I'm going to be performing to <laughs> so it's up to you uh, <laughs> so do you think all this you seem to be the same person as you were uh, 10 years ago I've seen a lot of people you know I've seen a lot of people go to Hollywood and I haven't gone to Hollywood <laughs> change a little bit or to America or become very successful, become that kind of successful and change quite a lot. Do you, do you still feel like you're the, the same John Oliver as, who died in all those gigs? I think so. I still yeah. fundamentally identify more with failure than success. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really feel like anything has changed. To be honest, I worked with... I worked with John Stewart for so many years, he's pretty unaffected. And also, we were kind of working in a bubble there. You don't really, I don't really go anywhere. So I, <laughs> once a year, even back then and now, I go to the Emmys and that's more of a, that's more of a moment where you kind of remind yourself, oh, I work in television. Because until that point, it really doesn't feel that way much. <laughs> At all, especially, especially now, like I'm just alone in a room, home. so yeah, there's no, and I don't see anyone or do anything, so it's, uh, yeah, no, I don't think, I don't think it has changed me at all, really. You do seem the same, you know, and it's not always for the worst, but I think it, you know, I think you you working very hard, and it obviously takes like a, it's a big pressure. And I think it's hard to be doing this year in and year out, right? No, yeah, I know you talked about John. For sure. I know you talked about John Stewart, like by the end, like looking tired to his bones. Definitely, and, yeah. You know, and that's gonna presumably that there's a shelf life to it in terms of just yeah. your ability to carry on putting yeah, in that amount, amount of work. Because I think you should do it. Like it goes back to what we were saying at the start. Like if you get the opportunity to do this, however you want to do it especially with a, a kind of budget that means you can do spectacular, fun things, then you should do it at like the highest rate and the highest effort that you can. And if you feel like you have to drop down a bit, you should just stop. Because I think at that point as well, it might start making me miserable. It's still, now it's still exciting because it still feels like, you're, like anything is possible. You can find ways to tell stories that are... Um, uh, either silly or spectacular and and the show can kind of change as you go tackling different things um, I think I think if I started feeling like I couldn't 
you know, when I was in England, I was pretty sad and sometimes resentful because like you were talking about in those, those moments where like BBC Radio is giving notes that you know are wrong, but you have to find yes. a way to kind of <laughs> wrestle with them. Um, I've been really lucky not to have those notes over the last 10 years. <laughs> I think if I f- if it starts to feel like I am the reason that I am that the show isn't as good as it should be, I need to fucking stop at that. Point. <laughs> well, I'm because to make sure you get hard. some. All the, all the staff yeah. work too hard for me to be the reason that things fuck up. Job. Sure. Yeah, I mean it's 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 great, but I you know also you see people like work and work and work and you know it's it's also just rem- you know I think you've probably got a good balance, and it's like you say working at home has probably been nice because you've. See, been with the family and everything, but it's just making sure it's such a hard thing because you've got to work so hard to get to where you've yeah. got to, and you've got to carry on working. And you know, but at some point, you want to be able to enjoy the fruits of it. I guess you know, just having faced more talent, looked mortality in the face. Yeah, you sort I, of think, you know, I are, guess the, are you getting the fruits of it for me? Are the show though? That's the thing is getting yeah. to do it. Like the, the the other fruits actually aren't really a motivating factor. So. Yeah. The, the thing itself, like if we, if we do something, like we did it a couple of years ago, we, we got to the end of this, we'd been sued by this uh, coal CEO and uh, it took years and I was really angry about it because he was a <laughs> kind of brutal bully and right. had launched these lawsuits against local papers here and had, had managed to kind of force people into silence. So we got to the end of this, we won it and then we staged this massive musical in Times Square and just to tell him to go fuck himself. And it was just the most euphoric feeling. Just because we were shooting it on an utterly absurd scale. Everywhere, like we had the trucks and lights and people, an orchestra had scored the song and everyone had worked so hard just to tell this guy to go fuck himself. And it really felt, uh, if that that's the fruit for me, that's the sweetest fruit. <laughs> Well, I do, and I love the I love the sort of charity aspect of the show as well. And that, that often you're offering pri- rewards to to food banks or whatever, or well, channeling money well, into the right into. That was the causes. thing. Like last year, all of a sudden, our production costs go down because <laughs> right. we're not in a studio. So it felt like we have to find a way to money launder HBO's budget to worthy causes. <laughs> so it was basically a year of that. Any joke. We'd have a punchline sometimes of, and we'll give twenty thousand dollars to food bank. Fucking go! <laughs> it's great. Well, look, uh, the one thing I want to ask you one more thing, and then we'll let you go because you've been very kind to give up for your day off to talk to us. Um, what, do you think we can do a show like any of the shows we're, we're talking about in the UK? It, why is it not working? The Mash Report. I don't know if you've seen the Mash Report, which I always enjoyed. Has just been um, it's Nish Kumar sort of front. It's the best I think the UK have done. Uh, at doing a show of this sort, although it's just been cancelled for, I think, uh, we can safely say some political reasons. Just oh, really? Well, the tabloids didn't really like it and were after it, partly because Nish, I think, might, he's, he's born in the UK, but I think he, they've got some problem with him. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, they were, they were critical of the government, as any satirical show could be. So they had four series. It was pretty good. But do you think... Is there a reason why it isn't really working in Britain in the same way as it seems to work in America? Or I don't know. Because you're from Britain, right? So there's no reason why yes. it couldn't, this show could And I, I certainly had Britain. like my fair share of bad experiences of, of that. I think yeah. the BBC is tricky, isn't it? Because um, was the match report on the BBC? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, my experience there was so bad because it felt like there was always mitigating factors uh, often pertaining to, like, for some reason, being needed to be seen to strike a balance. I don't really know sure. what that means. I'm not sure they can articulate it either, other than hitting all sides. Horseshit, which is so intellectually bankrupt, it's hard, <laughs> it's hard to engage in good faith with a bad faith argument without just hemorrhaging energy. Um, but so I think BBC was pretty tricky for that. Although, I mean, having said that, Armando managed to do things his way. I think the, I think the key thing is, I guess broadly, yes, there is absolutely no reason. <laughs> uh, I think uh, that the UK couldn't do it. I think the key thing is what you have to find a way to do 
is build up enough credit somehow to be left alone and then spend that credit on that and nothing else. Like there is nothing sure. more important than them leaving you the fuck alone. Sure. Um, and I guess Armando did have that. I think Armando also probably, w it was never, weirdly, it, it, it was sort of targeted quite broadly, wasn't it, at the media and at government. Right, and that, right. You know, it was never, it was never, I hate Boris Johnson. That's like, true. You know, was, I, I think, I guess that's what I loved about it so much. It was often yeah. conceptual rather than personal. I mean, I do yeah. think just broadly getting too into the personalities of, uh, uh, of, politicians is that's it's that is fun low-hanging fruit but yeah. policy is more interesting than personality always it's just hard sure. to make jokes about but it but it feels better when you do it but to your yeah to your large point there i really think there is no reason why the uk couldn't do it i think in the past when i was there i used to think well we just need a john stewart figure and he was present naturally talented but he also sacrificed a bunch of stuff I sort of do uh, uh, so that he could get the thing that was most important to him which is editorial control sure so I think that was right. in all, even in contract negotiations for him the most important thing was I get editorial control because otherwise I can't do my job and he was right about that yeah it's fascinating. It's, it's sort of, you know, I'm delighted it's happened for you, for you. It's definitely worked out for you. And obviously your life is completely different as a result of this of this happening. But, uh, it's, you know, from a comedy perspective, it sort of just seems, you know, you are enough of an outsider in the UK oh, to still sure. be an outsider in, in the UK. You know, it doesn't matter that you're, you know, I think you being British adds a little bit to you doing an American show, but not, I think it, that's... Maybe to begin with, right? You were in English I think to English begin with, voice. for sure. Yeah. But, it's, but now it doesn't seem to be anything to do with it. So it's it's a shame we've lost you, but I'm delighted we have because the shows you do <laughs> are all fantastic. And it's all going on now, right? So it's still, And we can watch it in the UK. It's on Sky. It's on Now TV in the UK. And often stuff turns up on uh, social media and YouTube, YouTube oh, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So people can watch these shows. If you haven't watched them, go and watch them all. They're great. Yeah. Um, that man and, in older uh, shot. You know, just yeah. give me a give me a chance. Just watch the first yeah. five minutes of one, <laughs> and if you if you honestly find yourself thinking not this shit again, then listen. You were right all along. <laughs> he was right. Maybe he was. Maybe he was. Maybe he was right. <laughs> um, thanks so much for your time, John. I won't take up any more of it. Amazing, ladies and gentlemen, the amazing John Oliver. Thank, thank you very much. We're back next week with Andy Osho. Uh, thank you very much. We will see you. Goodbye. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>